Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. It's so great to see you again tonight for our midweek Bible study and expound. We're in the book of Exodus, as you know. We are not moving rapidly. We will, later on, when we get from the narrative part where all the great stories are like now to some of the details of the law, we're gonna wanna pick up the pace a little bit, but uh, it gives us a chance in moving at this pace to go deeper rather than just fly over quickly and notice a few things. We're able to notice just about everything in the text, which is long, but a good way to do it. So open your Bibles tonight to Exodus chapter 8, and we'll begin the 8th chapter of the book of Exodus, and let's pray together. Father, uh, we come as your community. We're your people. Something that I noticed as I read our text this week where you identify with your people. You, you call those slaves your people. You call them mine. And we love that. We love that you love to identify with people on the earth who are in a covenant relationship with you, the living God. We're honored to be your sons and daughters, and as such, I pray that we would grow in, in what that covenant, that agreement, is all about, that there might be depth to our walk with you, and we would respond, because not just the New Testament, even though we're in that covenant, all of these things we're told in the New Testament, all of these things from the Old Testament were written for our admonition. There's lessons that are deep and rich, and they apply to us all. Help them to not be weary of them, but to rejoice in them, to apply them to understand them, and then to teach them to others, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are witnessing a birth in the book of Exodus. It's the birth of a nation. The delivery room is Egypt, and the people of God will be birthed from Egypt into the wilderness, finally to a place called Canaan, a land of their own. Births are always exciting, But births are always messy and painful. Anybody who's been a part of a birth could tell you their own story. I still, after many years, remember when my son was born, it was very painful, not only for my wife, but also for me. Because in the midst of her labor, she hauled off and hit me. She doesn't remember it, but she was in that (laughs) period called transition. And I'm trying to coach her saying, breathe, breathe, breathe. And it's like, you know, You can only take so much of that when you're in intense pain. So she just, bam, and it it hurt. It was a painful experience. (laughs) And I've been scarred ever since. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, refresher. The word exodus means the outgoing or the exit. The people of Israel are exiting the land of Egypt. They went into Egypt as a family. They're emerging from Egypt as a nation of over two million people. The themes of the book are redemption and revelation. Redemption, revelation. God redeems his people, God saves his people, delivers his people, and then God reveals himself. So redemption and revelation is the theme of the book. And by the way, I would say that is our story. If we were to give our testimonies and they would be wonderful to hear, that would be our basic Two elements. We have been saved. We've been redeemed from whatever you were into at whatever age it happened to you, you were redeemed. And then began the process of God revealing himself to you. Redemption and revelation. That's your testimony. That's my testimony. And those are the two themes of the book of Exodus. So as Sam said, and he was right, it applies to our lives. It's very personal. It's very applicable. Redemption and revelation. Now, the book of Exodus has three distinct parts, and we're in part number one. Let me break them down for you. Number one is domination 
by Egypt. Domination by Egypt. That's chapters 1 through 12. That is where the people of Israel feel under the brunt of the slavery imposed on them by the Egyptians. Dominance by Egypt. Then chapters 13 through 18 is part two, liberation from Egypt. And then finally, part number three, which is chapters 19 through 40, revelation after Egypt. The laws are given. The statutes are given. The new value system. The worldview that God wants his people to operate on begin in that third section. But we're in the first section, which is the domination by Egypt. Now, here's something else I think it's important that helps us frame the whole Bible. In the Bible, there's four distinct periods of miraculous events, four periods. There's miracles all through the Bible, but there are four distinct eras or epochs. Number one, the miracles that happened during the life of Moses, the 10 plagues and the miraculous way they were administered, whether it was touching the water with the rod or the rod becoming a snake. It was that whole time period where God miraculously, supernaturally intervened in history. That's era number one. Era number two is in the Old Testament also, under the prophet Elijah. Many miracles were done through the prophet Elijah and even his successor, Elisha. Again, there were miracles throughout the Bible But Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament take the lion's share of the miraculous events. Number three is the miraculous life of Jesus Christ. That's the one we're most familiar with. Jesus performed miracles, signs, and wonders to authenticate that he was the Son of God and Israel's Messiah. So of all four eras of miracles in the Bible, those three are past. The fourth is yet future. That will be in the great tribulation period when God intervenes once again in history in a worldwide display of miraculous events called the judgments or the wrath of the Lamb. Now, of those four periods, you still following me? Period number one and period number four are very similar. In period number one, the miracles of Moses, what emerges from that is a nation a new land, new laws, new values. Those are the birth pains of the nation of Israel in the country of Egypt before they get expelled and brought into the new land. The fourth, I said the first and the fourth are very similar. In the fourth, or the tribulation period, God, through those judgments, will eventually lead to a new land, that is, this earth, when Jesus Christ comes back, a new era upon the earth called the millennial kingdom that lasts a thousand years with a brand new government. So there is a parallel. One is a preview of the full-blown movie, which is era number four. Now, we've already covered uh, the first of the ten plagues. That was last week. Chapter seven, the first plague was what? And I, I'm sorry, it's probably not good to ask a crowd any question because this is what the answer sounds like. <laughs> and, but I think I know your answer. And you were all right. It was, when the, it was when the Nile River turned to blood. I think that's what you were all mumbling back to me. It's when the Nile River turned to blood. Why was that significant? It was significant because the primary source of water and the primary resource, natural resource, was the Nile River itself. It was considered a god to be worshipped. In fact, people would go down to the river, especially during a season, and we believe this is the summer season when Pharaoh would frequent the river as part of the worship system of the Egyptians. And there was a hymn that was sung to the Nile River itself, and here's one of the stanzas. Hail to thee, O Nile, that issues from the earth and comes to keep Egypt alive. So the first plague was a judgment upon that worship system of that false god, the Nile River. Chapter 8 has three more plagues, and we've already given it away what they are. Frogs, lice, and flies. Frogs, lice, and flies. Oh my, sounds sort of like the Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. These are not pleasant things to dwell on. And it was even less pleasant if you happened to be an Egyptian at this time period. 
Now, these plagues, as you remember, are answering a question that Pharaoh had. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should obey him? After all, Moses and Aaron came in and said, Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, commands you to let his people go. And he retorted, who is the Lord? And so God is going to graciously answer his question. He's going to introduce himself through a series of unmistakable attention-getting plagues. The first one we saw last week. The next three we see tonight. Verse 1 of chapter 8, plague number 2, frogs. And the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go. Not the people, not those people, my people. Notice again how he identifies himself, calls them mine. Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite or smash all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly. So the Bible in the New Testament promises abundant life. Here in the Old Testament, it promises abundant frogs to those who don't obey. Which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedrooms, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls, or the place where you make bread. So this, they're having a riveting conversation, you might say. Okay, sorry. Okay, please. Really. Verse 4. And the frogs... <laughs> sound effects and everything, these guys. And the frogs shall come up upon you on your people and on all your servants. In Egypt, one of the most beautiful temples for worship was a temple given to the ugliest goddess in Egypt. And that was the frog goddess Heka. If you wanted to spell it, I suppose it would be H-E-K-A, sometimes pronounced Hecate. Hecate or Heka. Now, she was depicted as having the body of a woman and the head of a frog. She was thought to be the wife of another god I mentioned last week, the god called Kanum. So Kanum married Heka, the frog goddess. And according to Egyptian legend, now this all helps so we know why these kinds of judgments. According to Egyptian legend, it was Kanum who fashioned man out of the dust of the earth on his potter's wheel. He took dust, added water, made clay, and fashioned man on a potter's wheel, gave that clay statuette to Heka, his wife. She breathed into the nostrils of that man or woman life, and so life upon the earth came to be. Heka, Heket, whatever pronunciation you'd like, was the goddess of fertility and resurrection. So when babies were born, she was thought by the Egyptians to be present helping the women in childbirth. Which makes me wonder, when Moses was found by the Pharaoh's daughter many years before, and he was called Moshe, drawn out of the water, I wonder if part of the praise that she gave wasn't to this god S. Heket, or Heka, for helping deliver this child into the world and delivering this child miraculously to her. We know it's by the will of God, but she probably ascribed that to Heka, the false goddess. Okay, it was an offense to kill a frog in Egypt. There were certain animals that were considered so sacred, sort of like in India, if you kill a cow, and I have actually heard of a bus drivers veering from a cow on the street in order to hit a human because killing a human is far less offensive than killing a sacred cow, and I kid you not. So to kill certain animals in Egypt were punishable by death, and if you killed a frog, even accidentally, you could be killed. It was a capital offense. So number two plague is attacking that part of their worship system, worship of this goddess. Verse 5, the Lord spoke to Moses. Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand 
with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand. He hopped right to it. Uh, Aaron. Aaron stretched, this, these are little things inserted just, just to see if you're with me, that's all. <laughs> so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. As I see it, plague number one and plague number two are related. If you remember last week, I mentioned the god of the Nile called Hapi. Do you remember that name? H-A-P-I. And I showed you how grotesque it, he was pictured. Hapi, in in many Egyptian hieroglyphics, was depicted as holding a frog, and out of the frog's mouth were issuing streams of abundance, or streams of life, streams of nourishment, they were called by the Egyptians. Now, Hapi, the god of the Nile, was considered to uh, oversee the alluvial plains of Egypt. You know, it's the sediment that the Nile River leaves that is very, very fertile. It's great for crops. So Hopi overseed the Nile alluvial sediments and the riverways that emerged from the Nile River, holding the frog, and out of the mouth came nourishment. So here is a judgment where the frogs are a nuisance. They're not providing nourishment. They're simply a nuisance. They're everywhere. Something else. They were superstitious. So if you were an Egyptian thousands of years ago and you'd walk along, if you'd see a frog, it was a good omen. To actually have a frog around was something good. Some people are superstitious. They see a bird and they go, that's a sign. Or something happens and goes, wow, I just saw two pigeons or something and they, they said something. That's a, that's a good omen. And people are still that superstitious. They were back then when they saw a frog, but you can have too much of a good thing. Imagine coming home from work in your chariot and there's a frog fest around all the streets of Cairo. Everywhere you go, squish, squish, squish. You come home at night, you open the fridge, there's frog pudding, you uh, try to get bread, there's a frog there in the closet, frogs in the cupboard, frogs, and you slip into your nice warm bed because you're tired, and there's cold, slimy, slippery frogs. It was a plague. Verse (laughs) 7, this is, to me, hilarious. If you ask me a question of why they did it, don't text that question. I'll just say, I don't know. (laughs) And the magicians did so with their enchantments. Oh, good. That's what we need when there's a plague. More of it. (laughs) And brought up frogs from the land of Egypt. Remember last time, just like with the Nile River, using their enchantments, they brought more blood out of more waterways after Moses and Aaron did so with the Nile River. Moses and Aaron bring frogs on the land. Only thing they can do, it's interesting. The only thing they can do is imitate, replicate, not eradicate the plague. They cannot take it away. As we will see later, Pharaoh begs Moses to talk to God and stop this plague. Now, we have an example of a counterfeit. And whenever there is a counterfeit, it's important. A counterfeit doesn't disprove the genuine, a counterfeit proves that something genuine exists. We have a counterfeit sign, counterfeit miracle, counterfeit wonder by whatever means it was done. We're not told. But it simply authenticates that there is an original or a real one, an authentic one. They cannot eradicate, they can simply duplicate. There's an interesting pattern I see with Pharaoh I told you before, I I see Pharaoh in many ways as a type of uh, devil, Satan, oppressor, enemy. Pharaoh's first tactic, he and his people, was violence, persecution. Uh, You remember he tried to kill all the male children of Egypt. That didn't work. He tried to oppress the adults of Egypt, the slaves, and make life miserable for them. So that's, that's number one, oppression or persecution. That didn't work because they kept growing as a people, becoming more vibrant. The Lord blessed them. So, phase number two, if persecution doesn't work, let's try imitation. We'll try to be like them, to confuse them, perhaps. If you were to turn, and don't do it, but if you were to turn to the book of Acts, I think you find the same kind of attacks 
in the early church. A frontal attack, a persecution, a violent attack where the church was effectively driven from Jerusalem because of the persecution. But as you go on later through the book of Acts, persecution doesn't work because the church keeps growing, so let's try imitation. You have Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5 of the book of Acts pretending to be something that they're not. They were really hypocrites, and they were judged for it. Later on in Samaria, Peter goes and finds that there was a man called Simon Magus who, it says, believed their message. But he wasn't a true, authentic believer, but an imitation believer. Because later on, he sees that the Holy Spirit is given through the laying on of hands, and he goes, psst, hey, show me how I can get that kind of power like you're giving to these people. I'll even pay you money for it. And so imitation became the ploy of Satan when persecution did not work And I find those things happening and repeating themselves throughout history and even present in the world today. Let's look at verse 8 now. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord, or pray to God. Talk to your Yahweh. Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Sounds like he's had enough. Yes? Mm, not really, you'll see. And Moses said to Pharaoh, now watch this, accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only. First of all, I'd like you to notice how polite Moses is. Accept the honor. I'd like to give you the honor, Pharaoh. You tell me when you want me to pray and when you want this plague of frogs to stop. Accept that honor. Even in judgment, Moses is polite. Now take a lesson from that, Christians, because sometimes we can get a tad bit arrogant around unbelievers and feel like we have the right to put on the attitude when we're around those people who are under God's judgment. We drive them away because we're not polite. Even Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that we should give people an answer for the hope that lies in us with humility and respect. That's the approach that Moses takes here. Now, he's telling Pharaoh to give him the time that he wants the frogs to go away. Why is he doing this? Simply to show Pharaoh that God... The God, Yahweh, is superintending this miraculous event. Look, Pharaoh, you say when, and I'll talk to God about it. Because Yahweh is in charge of every territory, including Egypt, which you think you are the sovereign ruler over and the deity over. And you're wrong. You can't control this. Your magicians can't control this. You say when you want this plague to stop, and God will stop it. Now, we have arguably the most amazing answer ever given in Scripture. Because you would think, you know, if you have a plague going on, you have some crazy thing like this happening, and somebody said, okay, when do you want this to stop? The answer, now, immediately, get rid of these slimy, stupid frogs, now. Look what he says. So he said, tomorrow... Hello? Tomorrow? It's an interesting answer. These frogs were becoming troublesome, but, but obviously it's nothing he couldn't live with. So one more night with the frogs. That's all I want, just one more night with these frogs. It's an interesting, amazing answer. When do you want this bad stuff to stop? Tomorrow. I just want one more night with the frogs. You know what? Sin is just like that. Sin is exactly like that. So when do you want to get rid of this mess? When do you want to leave all that bad stuff behind? When do you you want to stop doing that bad, nasty, sinful habit? Tomorrow. Just one more night. You know, no one has ever woken up in the morning and decided, I'm going to become one of the 12.5 million American alcoholics today. 
I'm, I'm going to take this drink, and I'm, it's going to lead to a life of alcoholism, and that's, that's my choice. I'm going to become an alcoholic. never happens that way. They take a drink. It might lead to another drink. might lead to another drink. might lead to a habit that leads to a lifestyle that becomes something hard to break. But it can en- enslave a person. And whether it's alcoholism or, or drugs or pornography or anger, there's lots of things that can enslave a person. What I find is many of these people caught in these habits will say, oh, it's really not a problem. I can stop any time I want. In fact, I'm going to stop tomorrow. <laughs> and then they wake up one day and they discover their whole life is filled with frogs. They're in the kneading troughs, they're in the ovens, they're in the closets, they're in the bed. Their whole life is consumed and it's controlling them. It's nothing they ever signed up for at first. So here's my question. What is there in your life, and I put myself in that category, in our lives, that God is saying to us, get rid of it now. Deal with it now. Leave it behind tonight. And we go, okay, that's good. Tomorrow. God is saying, by my grace and strength, it can be tonight. Um, Before I continue verse 10, because I wanted to hang on the word tomorrow. We have a question that was texted in about some of these plagues. We'll be dealing with them this week and next week. And the text question, and you can see it on your screen up there in front, is during the plagues, did they affect the Egyptians only, or did they affect everyone, including the Lord's people? Well, you're going to discover the answer if you just hold on a few verses. I I promise you that. Because you're going to discover that it happened in the land of Egypt, but God wanted the Egyptians to make sure they understood this was a judgment from Yahweh that excluded his people. That this kind of wrath that he was pouring out on the world did not affect his people. That God was making a very important difference in judgment. And I'll tell you why, that's a great question, first of all. And it's such an important question because that question is a question that answers another question that a lot of people have about the future judgment that God is going to bring upon the earth. So let's continue. In verse 10, and he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, from your people. They shall remain in the rivers only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh. And so the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the homes, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. So to make matters worse, not only did they have frogs, they have dead frogs. (laughs) Question, what what do you feed a dead frog? A dead fly. Okay, sorry. Let's go on. Uh... They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Hard to imagine. I, I, uh, well, think of a dead fish smell. smell. Or or if uh, I had salmon in the refrigerator the other day, and uh, we thought it out and kept it in the refrigerator, maybe marginally just a little bit too long, and... Wow, what a ripe odor that thing can have. And even the package of the salmon in the garbage, when I smelled it today before I took the garbage out for tomorrow, man, it was at rank. So piles and piles of their dead goddess everywhere, stinking, putrefying, smelling, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, watch this, He hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Well, doesn't that sound familiar? How many times have people promised, oh, God, please just get me out of this, and I promise I'll I'll do this for you. And then relief comes, it's like, did I say that? (laughs) Whatever. When relief comes, they forget the vow or the covenant or the pact that they make. So that's the second plague. Now let's go to the third plague. Lice are mentioned. So the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land. So he'd go out there, take his rod and hit the dirt, hit the dust. 
so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. There's an important bit of information you need to know. One of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped was the earth god called Geb, G-E-B, Geb. Geb, the earth god, according to their theology, reported to the god Osiris that we mentioned a few weeks ago. Osiris was the keeper of the afterlife in Egypt. Geb reported the state of the earth or the state of the earth for harvest to Osiris on a regular basis. They worshiped Geb, the earth god. Now, I'm going to read to you a firsthand account of a traveler some years back traveling through Egypt with an interesting phenomenon. Here's his words, quote, I noticed that the sand appeared to be in motion. Um, Close inspection revealed that the surface of the ground was a moving mass of minute ticks, thousands of which were crawling up my legs. I beat a hasty retreat, pondering the words of the scriptures, the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Nasty plague. Nasty plague. Was it lice or was it gnats? I'm asking that because I fear if I don't, somebody will text that and I'll have to answer it via a text. Not that I mind that. But most translations, more modern translations... Take the word in Hebrew, kinim is the Hebrew word, which is a general word for all sorts of little bugs, and translate it gnats, which is very, very important, I think, and more significant than being lice, because gnats were considered to be pollutants to any of the Egyptian temples. So if they were overrun with gnats, it was an insult to the Egyptian gods and goddesses. And that's probably what it was, these gnats. By the way, how many of you have ever been to a Passover um, in America or anywhere, anywhere, a Passover during Passover time? Okay, so you know that during Passover, the Passover feast, when you're with the family or your friends and you have the meal in front of you and you go through the ritual called the Haggadah and, and you're reading about what happened in the land of Egypt. At one particular part of the feast, the host will dip his finger in the glass of wine so it's like blood, and sprinkle it 10 times on the plate. So he'll dip his finger in, and he'll say the first plague, blood, and he'll smatter a little bit of wine on the plate, dip it again, and say frogs. So he'll go, blood, um, blood, frogs, um, uh, lice, flies. Or, but, but the word lice he will often use is gnats. And so it is believed that these were these little tiny gnats that were crawling around. Kyle and Dielich, two German authors, write this. There's a species of gnats so small as to be hardly visible to the human eye, but with the sting, which according to Philo and Origen, two church fathers that lived in Egypt, causes a most painful irritation to the skin. They even creep into the eyes and the nose, and after the harvest, they rise in great swarms from the inundated rice fields. So just try to picture it. Down your neck, up your legs, in your nostrils, in your ears, whizzing around and biting. What a plague this is. We live in New Mexico in a pretty bug-free environment. Oh, you have a few of them, but not compared to most places on Earth. I was once camping in the northern United States by the Canadian border, dead of summer, by a lake, and I was attacked by a plague <laughs> that came as I was set, we were setting up our tent and this like swarm of bugs and I, I, I didn't care to even look at them and find out what they were. All I know is I was bitten everywhere and I could hear them and see them and breathe them for days. So we just packed up and left. These people couldn't. Wherever you lived in Egypt, this plague filled the land. Verse 18. Now the magicians worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice. Why? (laughs) But notice this, first time we read it, but they could not. 
They could replicate, not eradicate, up to this point, now they can't even replicate. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said. You know, if I'd have been a magician in Egypt, I'd have packed my bags, taken the first flight out of Cairo. I'm out of town, and I'd send my resume to every other world ruler to see if I could get a job in that country because I don't want to hang around Egypt. What a horrible thing to be on the list as a magician. The Egyptian priests were known for their physical purity. In fact, the word for priest in ancient Egyptian was uab, U-A-B, uab, and it meant the pure ones. The priests shaved all the hair from their head, their face, and their entire body. They um, bathed in water frequently during the day, and they wore linen garments. Physical purity was of utmost importance to them. This is something they couldn't control. And to have this kind of a plague on the body of a priest, of an uab, of a pure one, was an indication that his prayers had become ineffective to the pantheon of Egyptian gods. Isn't that interesting? And so that's why these magicians said, hey, this is the finger of God. We can't even replicate it. Of course, if I were Pharaoh, I'd say, you mean you tried to? But nonetheless, they did. They couldn't do it. And they said, this is the finger of God. There's an important distinction. In Hebrew, it's, this is the finger of Elohim, not the finger of Yahweh. They're not being specific because you remember Moses kept saying, the Lord, Yahweh has sent us. This is the God, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. The magicians are saying, this is the finger of Elohim, in plural, the gods. That is, they are acknowledging this comes from a supernatural source above and beyond their idea and their worship system. But they're not acknowledging Yahweh yet. A very important distinction. Something else. This term, the finger of God, appears at other times in the Bible, either in story form or in exact verbiage. Let's fast forward to uh, Babylon when Daniel is standing in the court of Belshazzar because a man's hand is writing on a wall. Many, many tekel you farsen, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God used the hand of a man, but it was the finger of God writing a message out to the king. Or how about Jesus when he wrote on the ground when they were trying to stone that woman caught in adultery, the finger of God was writing on the ground. And then Jesus even used this exact language when he said in the New Testament, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God in the Old Testament, the finger of God in the New Testament. This miracle was designed to show up the gods of Egypt, the false gods of Egypt. Here's a question that we have, and let's throw it up before we get into the fourth plague of flies. Oh, boy. The text question is, why did Pharaoh never directly attempt to murder Moses and Aaron in these early meetings? That's a good question. And it's a question that the commentators have dwelt upon and tried to give answers to unsatisfactorily. Uh, we don't know why. Except, A, um, he had a hunch that if they were able to pull off those kind of miracles, maybe he would get into deeper trouble. It would jeopardize his life. Number two, keep in mind the amount of slaves that were backing Moses and Aaron and wanted to get out of Egypt. Two and a half million. That'd be a big uprising. You know, if you have, have 100,000 people in Tahrir Square in Cairo, the governments of the world are looking at that. You have two and a half million people in Egypt throwing an uprising? Look out. So perhaps by sheer numbers of the rebellion of the workforce would be enough to stave him off. Verse 20 is the fourth plague. Let's get to it. We only have 15 minutes left. Skip. You only have 15 minutes left. Go, go ahead. Okay, here it is. And the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. There's his daily ritual performed during the summer, giving homage to the Nile River. And say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go. Same message, hasn't changed. He's on point. That they may serve me. Or else, 
Now, here's a little, a little caveat attached to the command. You let my people go or else, or else what? Here it is. If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the, on the ground on which they stand. In my studies, I discovered that most scholars who research ancient Egypt and the environment of Egypt as it is today say that this fly must have been, called, it's, it's what's, what's known as the ichneumon fly. And the ichneumon fly attaches itself to living organisms where it can lay its eggs on, its larvae, which will feed on that organism. So if it's on a plant, those eggs, that larvae, will kill that organism. And they will attach to animals and even to humans. When you enrage an ichneumon fly, I'm told, if you really tick off this fly, it latches itself onto the human body, especially the edges of the eyelids. And it stings, it bites, and causes enormous swelling of the the skin, the cutaneous matter, the, the eyelids, and it's, it's a very miserable state of affairs. The Egyptians regarded the fly as the manifestation of a god called Uachit. So if you, it's interesting, you watch it, like a New Yorker, you watch it. U A T C H I T, if you were to spell it, you watch it. The god you watch it symbolized by the fly, also known by other people in the area as Bilzebub, the Lord of the Flies. You watch it, or Bilzebub, two ancient names. That's one possibility. Another group believed that this isn't the fly like I just mentioned, the ichneumon fly or the common house fly, but the scarab beetle. Are you familiar with that? It's a symbol in Egypt. It's all over the tombs of Egypt. It's all over Egyptian hieroglyphics. That little scarab beetle, which represented the beetle god. I don't mean John Paul George and Ringo, that beetle god, but I mean the little insect beetle, which was a symbol of eternal life. That's why when when kings or people were buried, they would often put a little or several little um, amulets of scarabs to represent eternal life. Verse 22, and in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen. Now, we had a question a moment ago about did this happen to the whole land of Egypt or did God make a difference with his people? Here's the answer. In that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen. The land of Goshen is where the Israelites lived. That's that eastern part of Egypt in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land Verse 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Please mark that. Please remember this. I will make a difference between your people and my people. Tomorrow this sign shall be, and the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. Here God promises to make a difference in judgment. In the future, there is coming upon the earth what happened in Egypt on steroids. What happened in Egypt on a grander scale, in a more intense scale, you can read about it in the book of Revelation, chapter 16 through 19, swarm after plague after judgment is upon the entire earth. Millions upon millions upon millions of people will be killed in those judgments. But something you need to know about your God, your God knows how to make a difference when it comes to judgments. Now, the Bible does say, in the world, you will have tribulation. And we know that believers, as well as unbelievers, have their share of hard times as well as good times, diseases as well as health. Jesus said the sun and the, um, uh, the what? The rain, thank you. That's that scripture. The sun will fall on the just and the unjust, and the rain will fall on the just and the unjust alike. So we know that as part of 
the world of mankind, in this world you will have tribulation. But, now listen carefully, but, that's in this world. And the source of that tribulation is essentially from a fallen world under the dominion of the God of this world who is called Satan. But when it comes to judgment from the Lord, that's something different. When God is the origin of the tribulation, not the world, then God makes a difference. And here's a scripture I'm going to read to you that settles that matter in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. For God did not spare even the angels when they sinned, but he threw them into hell, in gloomy caves and darkness until the judgment day. God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and his family of seven. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment, and then God destroyed the whole world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into heaps of ashes and swept them off the face of the earth. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But at the same time, says Peter, God rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a good man who was sick of all the immorality and wickedness around him. Yes, he was a righteous man who was distressed by the wickedness that he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly people from their trials, even while punishing the wicked right up until the day of judgment. In other words, when it comes to judgment from God, he knows how to make a difference. He did it in Egypt, and he will do it in the future. Now you'll notice verse 25 God has Pharaoh's attention. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God. But notice the qualifier, in the land, in the land. Now they said, hey, we're leaving the land, dude. We're crossing the borderline. We're out of here. We're going to go out into the wilderness. Pharaoh goes, Go, but do it in the land. Stay in the land of Egypt. This is the very first time when Pharaoh is giving permission for them to go and sacrifice. But he doesn't want them to leave. This is called compromise. We're familiar with it. Satan is great at negotiating compromise. He'll say, well, go ahead and go to church, but just don't become one of those Christians. Don't, like, be a fanatic. You can, you can visit a church, that's okay, but don't be one of them. Or if you happen to be one of them, like I am and you are, then he will say things like, go ahead and be a Christian, but keep some of those old habits, because that's who you are. He wants you to compromise. A book that you must read, it was a recommended reading in high school and mandatory in college, was called The Screwtape Letters by uh, C.S. Lewis. The Screwtape Letters is about a senior demon named Screwtape taking his nephew named Slubglob and teaching Slubglob how to be a good demon and ruin people's lives. So it's written from that perspective. And Screwtape, when he writes to Slubglob, always calls um, the newly converted Christian your patient. And one of the lines of the book says, to keep your patient interested in religion is the focus. Just keep him interested in religion. Don't let him go far away with his thing. Just keep him interested in religion. Negotiate with him. Compromise with him. Tell him to compromise. There was once a hunter who was after a bear. He saw a bear and he was about to pull the trigger, saw it in his scope because the bear wanted a, a fur coat from the bear, a bear coat. They're really cool. That's what he thought. So he saw it in his scope, and the bear turned around and saw the hunter with the scope and the, the muzzle of the uh, gun pointed right at him. And the bear said, now, wait a minute. What are you doing? The hunter said, I'm about to pull the trigger and kill you. The bear said, now, wait a minute. Put that gun down. Let's just talk about this. I think we can safely negotiate and come to a compromise. What is it you'd like? The hunter said, I'd like a fur coat. And the bear said, well, that's good. That's a good start. All I want is a good meal. Well, so let's talk about this. So they went off into the forest. The gun was put down, arm in arm. They walk and they talk and they talk and they negotiated. And a few minutes later, the bear came out <laughs> licking its chops, patting its belly, and, and they both got what they wanted. The hunter got a fur coat and the bear got a good meal. 
That's what compromise will do. You'll eat your lunch, or somebody else will. Go and sacrifice, but do it in the land. Stay in the land. Now stop for a moment and think what a temptation it may have been for Moses to stay in the land. After all, well, we could do it in the land. This is where we've been living for a long time. We're familiar with it. We at least get food here. We get provisions here. We, we may be oppressed, but it's better than nothing out in the wilderness. It is hard for people to change, and especially the older we get, the more set in our ways we become. We like things the way we're used to them, and we don't want change to upset our way of doing things. This is one of the reasons that the older a person gets, statistically, it's more difficult, and I say statistically, from a human level, for them to receive Christ. According to statistics that are often quoted and given by the Billy Graham Association years ago, it's estimated that if you're 25 years of age, this is done by those who come to Christ at Crusades, your chances of conversion are 1 in 5,000. If you're 35 years of age, your chances of conversion would be 1 in 25,000. If you're 45 years of age, your chances of conversions are 1 in 60,000. If you're 55 years of age, your chances of conversion are 1 in 125,000. And for you to get saved from age 65, 70, 75 and above would be statistically regarded as impossible. Of course, what's impossible with men, Jesus said, is possible with God. God specializes in impossible situations. But maybe Moses would just tempt it. Yeah, that's a good compromise. That's a good deal. We'll just stay in the land. But look what he says, verse 26. It's not right for us to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abominations of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? What does he mean? Well, they worshiped animals like the cow and the ox and other animals. For the Israelites to kill them and shed the blood of these animals, blood sacrifices were not the norm in Egypt. They were considered an abomination. They would be afraid of an uprising from the Egyptians, so this makes perfect sense. Verse 27, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he will command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness only you shall not go very far away. So first he says, go ahead, but do it in the land. Moses said, can't do it in the land. We're going to kill animals. You're not into that stuff. We're going to get beat up. Okay, well, go ahead and go, but don't go very far. Sounds like my mom when I was growing up. Then Moses says, pray for me, intercede for me. So Pharaoh's lengthening the chain but there's still a chain. He says, don't go far. He's not anxious to let two million people on his workforce take a leave of absence. Don't go very far away. Again, one of the world's favorite lines is something like this. Hey, I've heard that you're into religion now. Do me a favor. Don't go too far into this thing. I've heard of people that really got into this Christian born-again stuff, like they read their Bible all the time, they go to church all the time, and they went crazy. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go very far. It's the same old line. I dated a girl before I married my wife, Lenya, and uh, I got to lead her to the Lord, Linda Brown. This is in Orange County, and I'll never forget. Uh, Linda came to Christ. She started reading her Bible, going to church, and she had an appetite for the things of the Spirit. When I ran into her old friends... They said, man, you have ruined our friend Linda. You, you've just like taken all the fun out of her life. She's like went too far into this thing. What have you done to her? Then later on, when I took her home one night after church, her father pointed his finger right at me and said, you are ruining my family. She's bringing a Bible into my home. She goes, I want, he's go, I want you to know, we're a very religious home. We go to church every Sunday, but my daughter's gone too far. What the world calls, question, can you go overboard? 
in loving Jesus? Now, I will say, I will concede that you can have zeal without knowledge. You can do stupid things in the name of the Lord and make it bad for everybody. I remember a guy at Pope Joy Hall years ago when you would walk into one of the plays that they would hold, would be yelling at people in the name of the Lord. All that did is make anybody even remotely interested in spiritual things, click, turn off, never want to listen to it again. They're all nutcases. So you can have zeal without knowledge. You can become self-righteous and thus nauseating to the world. But... What's interesting is the world will say, you've gone too far. You like lift your hands and and like get excited and like sing loud. Yet they'll go to a basketball game (laughs) and go, it's like, really? And you're not a nut. Enough said, verse 29, Moses said, indeed I'm going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, from all his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from the Pharaoh, and he entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people, not one remain. Notice that little detail. Not one remain. Unmistakably, God was in charge of this. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Boy, does this guy have a heart of titanium. So hard, so rigid. Blaise Pascal, the ancient philosopher, said, the heart has its own reasons that reason does not know. Any reasonable man would say, give it up, Pharaoh, dude. You don't have a chance. This is the finger of God. And if his finger can do this, wait till the hand of God comes upon you. But as Pascal said, the heart has its reasons for the reason that reason does not know. What's your condition of your heart? tonight. You'll recall that Jesus spoke of four types of soil in the New Testament. A sower went out to sow seed. Some of it fell upon the wayside or the path where people walk. It was very hard, and so that the birds of the air, Satan and his minions, stole the seed before it could even take root. Some people hear the word and they go, ah, it's a bunch of nonsense. Ah, I don't want to listen to it. Other people, Jesus said, are those who hear the word like those where the seed falls upon soil that doesn't have much depth of earth. And they listen for a while, and they get all excited for a while and all emotional for a while, but when the trials come, just like the sun that beats down on that earth and dries that up, that little seedling, sometimes the world just, and the trials of this world, kill it. Then Jesus said, there was seed that fell upon soil that was um, stony and rocky and had weeds around it, and the weeds came and choked it up and it couldn't bear fruit. Then Jesus said the fourth type of seed fell upon good soil, and it brought forth fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold. What is the condition of your heart tonight? Is it soft before the Lord? Are you still letting God speak to you? Are you still letting him in? Is the word penetrating your heart, or does it stop at a little certain place, and you kind of think about it, and then maybe harden your heart a little bit, and don't let the Lord have control of all of you? Let's bow our heads, and as we do, we think, we meditate, we contemplate. The condition of our heart before the Lord, is it soft, is it supple? Have we grown rigid, unteachable in certain areas, unapproachable in other areas, where God has been trying to speak to us? We have walls carefully built of reason and rationale, and we don't really think upon it deeply enough so as to let his truth enter our very core. Are you the kind that receives the word eagerly, but in times of hardship, you fall away? Are you the type that receives the word, but the cares of this world, the riches of this world, the desire for other things, choke it and it becomes unfruitful? Or are you bearing forth fruit? Some a little bit, 30-fold, some more, 60, some a lot, 100-fold. 
All of that depends on the condition of your heart. Now, as we're thinking and praying through this, as we're contemplating still as we close, if you recognize that maybe up to this point you've had a shallow heart or even a hardened heart, and you've heard about these statistics of people coming to Christ, and yet the Lord is dealing with you, and He's been telling you for a while, you need to surrender. You need to give your life to me tonight. You need to let go and let me live my life through you. Maybe he's been telling you that, and you know he's been telling you that. Or for some of you, he's telling you to return to your first love because you have backslidden, you've fallen away, you're not really walking with Christ. If either of those describe you tonight as our heads are bowed, I want to pray for you as we close. I want you to raise your hand, and in raising your hand, you're saying, Skip, that's me. I need to get right with God. I'm going to do it tonight. Here's my hand. Here's my heart. Pray for me. God bless you and you and you toward the back, you in the very back, on the side to my right, on the extreme right, right up toward the front in the middle. Anyone else? Raise that hand up. Father, you see these hands and you know these hearts like you know all of our hearts. And I pray that as you draw men and women to yourself, as we rejoice in your work in their lives, you would solidify, solidify in their hearts the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord above all other gods, all other pursuits. Let them know the joy of salvation. And we pray they would bear much fruit in the days and weeks ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. You that have come forward, I'd like to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ. It's very simple. Prayer is just talking to God, and you're going to ask Jesus to come into your life. I'm going to pray out loud, and I'd like you to pray out loud after me from your heart, and say these words to the Lord with all of your heart. Let's pray. Lord, I give you my life. I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he paid for my sin, and that he rose from the dead. I turn from my sin. I leave it behind. I turn my life to you. I make you my Lord and Savior by faith in your finished work. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me your power to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen.